are now locked into Radio Juxtapose, the home of contemporary art and culture conversation. Coming up today. How can you ask me to be a part of this like diversity campaign where you have allocated nothing to, to help any sort of movement or any sort of uh, anyone struggling because of COVID, because of like police brutality, because of whatever that's going on. Your brand has done absolutely nothing and you think hiring me to be the face of some diversity thing is gonna solve your problems, it's not. This is Radio Juxtapose. Over the last year, we've had a fair share of guests on this podcast with mixed opinions towards the advertising world, but none like today's guest. I mean, the clues in our artist's name. Hate copy, because she hated writing copy. So instead, she wrote a book. Welcome to Radio Juxtapose, your regular dose of art world news and opinions hosted by Juxtapose magazine's Evan Preco and myself, Doug Gillen. On today's show, we're joined by South Asian Canadian artist Maria Kumar. At the age of nine, Maria's life changed quite dramatically when she flew with her parents to Canada from Pakistan. Despite Canada's excellent PR at being leaders of liberal values, Maria found herself on the receiving end of racial abuse throughout her childhood. Kids really can be pricks. Later on in her life, after departing the advertising world, she went on to start a career in art Not an easy move when you've got a family pressuring you to follow a more traditional path. But since then, she's taken the moment and absolutely ran, amassing a pretty serious following online. She's crafted her own identity, one which puts her culture front and centre of her practice. What I'm trying to say here is that there's a lot to talk about with our guest today. And I don't know if any of you are needing a little inspiration in your life about the choices you've made and the direction you're going, but maybe this will help offer a little guidance. Maria's latest exhibition, Me, Mira, Self and I, just opened up digitally through the Richard Tattinger Gallery. This got Evan and myself into talking about the future of gallery spaces post-Covid. Enjoy the episode. What's your experience so far then of virtual galleries and using them? What's your your hot take on it? If you were a buyer, is that convincing enough, this environment convincing enough for you to actually pull the trigger on something that you were on a maybe? Because at the end of the day, this is a showroom. Don't most people buy art without actually seeing it in person anyway? So I don't really know if anything's changed. I guess that's the whole thing. Is like, I actually don't feel like much has changed for buyers. Hmm. I think it's changed a little bit more for just a casual person. So it's just our experience that changes, which means would that I be enough that, to convince uh, the gallery model to to go back to yeah. physical space? Because if they're like, well, actually, right. sales are sales are the same. It's only the people that come in for you know for a look that probably won't buy anything. It's only them that we're appeasing here are the people that are coming down for free drinks on opening night. Free, free, yeah, free drinks and Instagram. Yeah. Um, I think that you're probably going to see more art galleries if they're mm. in places mm. that seem to be tumultuous and not uh, not feasible to be physically open. I think you're going to just see more virtual stuff and more uh, digital experiences when it comes to art shows. I don't... I just think I just think the myth of like somebody walking into a gallery and being wowed by a by a Connor Harrington painting that they've never heard of before and they buy it sight you know sight right there you know like that's like kind of a myth that doesn't really happen mm. you know people don't just casually walk into a gallery and drop thousands upon thousands like generally just a little bit of research involved I mean it does happen but I think most galleries have like people that are interested ahead of time and there's like a whole like system uh, so I don't know I just think that we might be appeasing the one percent continually 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 at all times that, that i mean i don't know does do you, do you agree do you agree like don't you think like more we're gonna see more we're gonna see less physical spaces i forward? well this is this is the question i mean I, I i really don't know i don't know what it means i think it maybe does it mean that we just change the way that we're conducting the physical spaces does it mean that if artists are not so reliant on that do they did they do something different? I, I, I really don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But I do think that the art opening, as much as you and I go for free drinks, mm. 
words. There is still something in the lexicon of art that the opening matters and like the other artists that show up and the people and like there is something about the community of an art opening that's part of the whole historical conversation about art and that that will be lost and that's too bad. Well, this is what I mean. If if this goes, I don't think... I feel like it's such an integral part of our experience and our community within the art world that yep. I don't believe that it, if galleries don't fill this 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 void, this you know, this space, this physical space for us to engage and talk to each other and and get to know each other and uh, and see if galleries aren't doing that, then surely there's a void there to be filled by someone else. I know, and I that's I think we should ask we should ask Maria about this because I'm curious what she felt like she lost by not having an opening. We actually haven't asked an artist that yet. What have you lost in that feeling? Because a lot of artists that you and I know have anxiety. They're all nervous that they're opening. They're miserable. Like if they like half to have of them a drink, don't even turn up. A couple, half of them don't even turn up. Yeah. Uh, especially in the world that you and I come from, like they just don't. They don't, or they're outside and they're kind of like, I don't yeah, want to yeah, deal yeah. with this. But I. But what what is lost in this? Because now we're getting into the fall season, which is when a lot of galleries have their big openings for the year. And like, what are we gonna miss in not having these openings? And what does an artist feel about that not happening? I was talking to the artist uh, Trenton Doyle Hancock the, on the phone the other day. Sorry, Trenton, gonna out you on this one. But uh, he you know he's sending a bunch of large paintings to New York for a big fall show, and, and he just had a big museum show at Mass Mocha last year so like he's this is you know his shows are a big deal now and he's like making these large paintings like yeah i'm sending them to new york i like and i you know kind of feel weird that like i'm it's just all different i don't get to spend time with them again they're just gonna go and that's kind of it it's kind of it's so there is this weird thing even artists don't get a second chance to see those works you know unless they have a museum retrospective years later or something that's kind of weird it's usually that gallery opening is like your last time with those paintings before they're sold. Do you think this is potentially setting up this weird kind of like vortex in which the it does just become more about a product and buying and sales and investment? Oh, than, dude. Like, dude, or, is, sure. is that because it already obviously exists in such a huge way? But of course, it just yeah. feels it just feels like this is, you know, it's almost just simplifying things for that to just be. A market and i think you're so you're right because it's i think like bottom line is that the capital a art world is listening to us and we're naive because like it's all about the market and it's all about selling i get that but for people like you and i who in, who who can't afford a twenty five thousand dollar painting there's still an enjoyment for us to go and see the work and kind of experience it even without any prospect of buying the painting there's still an enjoyment level in that and an appreciation and maybe we'll buy the catalog so I do think we're going to lose something and it's going to become even there's going to be less opportunities to appreciate what's happening because you're going to be even the, the gatekeepers might even get stronger in a weird way. Right. It's just it's I don't know. It's all up in the air. But that's every single thing. That's every single. I mean, and now I'm thinking, like, can you ever avoid giving Jeff Bezos money anymore? Like, can you ever avoid it? No. God, I'm trying like, hard. There's just so many. I'm trying hard to still haven't ordered anything off Amazon. Yes. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Fuck you. He's not listening, is he? He is. I think you're the first uh, Canadian artist we've had on the on the podcast. Congratulations! If you would like to say anything in Canadian, please do. Thank you. What's my prize? Uh, being the fiftieth uh, guest. Um, <laughs> Yeah. that's the prize all right i'll take it so how how are things how is life you just had a show we'll get into how you feel about having a show right now but you just had a show how are you feeling feeling pretty good uh it's it's really uh you know it's it's a time it's a very interesting time for not just me but for everybody working uh like nothing is going wrong with the world it's a time so it is you know you want to you want to celebrate little 
like uh, milestones in your career, but you also are like hyper aware of like <laughs> none of that. Does any of this matter? Does it is it essential? You know, you're you know just been going through the, an existential crisis this entire time, uh, trying to figure out how we can actually go back to the gallery world the way it once was, um, and how how that even looks, you know, outside of virtual reality and or is that going to be like a permanent thing for us now well that's that's perfect is exactly what, what we, we were, were just, just talking, talking about. about yeah we were on on this is you know obviously where the kind of the headspace is you don't see it going back to the way that it was you, what would you like to see return and what would you not like to see return from your experience doing a, vi a virtual exhibition yeah i mean i i started on instagram <laughs> Like I, I painted in real life, but I posted it on Instagram because I didn't know anyone in the art world. I didn't know any galleries. It was just, I'm going to make this thing and post it online. And so I treated my Instagram page as the gallery, like as a virtual gallery. And this was five years ago or six years ago. It's really funny to see now that like this is, this is kind of the norm where everybody's kind of moving the artwork into like a digital gallery or virtual gallery where it, it's kind of like that that foundation luckily for me had had already been there so i didn't see much of a change in my regular scheduling i would have loved like for me the the thing i really wanted to see was you know obviously my work nice little paintings like hung up in a gallery and where people can come and go look at it and it's like a very big change for somebody that started in the digital space originally I would love for galleries to open up again so I can have that, uh, you know, that little piece of, uh, of joy. But I think if this is how it's going to be for an unforeseeable amount of future, then, it, you know, it, it really makes not much of a difference in how I'm working uh, right now anyways. So the, the quarantine, yeah. like the isolation, all of the work I make in my house, I have no coworkers, I don't have a dog or a cat. It's just me in my house all the time. You know, I'm isolated most of the day or like if I'm going on a date or like if I'm hanging out with friends, maybe like that's the first time I would interact with people. Um, so this this has been really weirdly like the same, but now everybody else is at home. So now there's more eyes on the work than there was before. Right. Uh, so that's like a change I'm, I'm getting used to. But more or less, everything has kind of been the same career wise for me. Do, do you feel like, and this is just a general question, because we were, Doug and I were talking about this before we got on, was do you feel like there is something lost without like that sort of, I, I feel like if you're an art buyer, being at the opening doesn't matter. But like if you're somebody who just enjoys the arts and part of the, the fun is the opening because you get to see your friends, you get to see what other artists showed up. There's like this culture within the opening that's lost now. And like, do you feel like, that's kind of a bummer or are you kind of like, I'm so happy. I don't have to like, you know, white knuckle myself through a, my own opening. No, of course. Like I think the, the reason I wanted the work in, in galleries in the first place, not because I see galleries as like a prestigious or anything like, you know, other than uh, a partnership where you can, you can bring an artist that wouldn't necessarily have access to a physical space. Like, you know, you, it, there's like a, there's a an equal exchange, um, an understanding uh, where both parties are kind of getting what they want. But for me, the biggest bonus to being in a gallery was that I get to see tons of like South Asian art enthusiasts that would walk in a gallery. And you know, last year we had a show um, with Richard Tadinger in New York. There were so many people that were that wanted to come in and and look at the artwork and you know, get to know me and talk to me one-on-one -on -one and, and kind of see the artwork. It was really good to know. And for the rest of that month, we extended it by another month. And for that rest of that time, actually people and students were using it as like a meeting point before they went out and explored New York. So there were people that were kind of just sitting on the beanbag chairs and like using it as like a nice little meeting spot. And I, and I said, what a cool thing to see. Cause I never, I never got to do that. Like I never felt art galleries were like a place where you could just hang out and chill. And it made mm -hmm. me feel really good that that the community was so comfortable with my work and so comfortable with seeing it and being around it that they could walk into a gallery and not be 
like scared of like white walls and like quiet, you know, environment. Cause when I was younger and I used to go into an art gallery, look at, you know, just a random white man's art, it would be super quiet in there. And like, I would, I would be whispering to my friends like, Oh, I really like that. You don't have to whisper in a gallery. Would you just feel like that because it's so tense. Right. The environment is so tense. So that was kind of what I liked about the show last year, which I really wanted to do uh, this year as well. Um, but I like that the show got, you know, great reception, regardless of it being online or, or in real life. So do you see a level of importance then of facilitating that? There needs to be a place where, you know, you said that there was people that, you know, you hadn't, that didn't really get a chance to go to shows like that or feel like that was an environment that was, you know, specifically for them. If that only exists in the digital world where, you know, where can it exist in the physical world if there's no gallery? Yeah, I think it's on it's on the galleries to give uh, more artists of color a physical space. Um, I mean, we've been making our own anyways. Like when I used to have uh, exhibits before this, it was always in like somebody's like bar or like someone's garage or whatever. We just kind of made those spaces for ourselves because we're like, fuck it, these galleries won't accept us or acknowledge us, so we can just make our own. And funny enough, that's how the work kind of got recognized too, where it says, okay, well, th these like, um, you know, these artists and they're kind of like emerging from Instagram or just bringing their artwork to like the physical space. And, you know, it'd be really cool to see it in like a, a museum or, or something like that. So it's good. I mean, last year was kind of the first official like solo exhibit that I had. Um, and I was, you know, I'm looking forward to doing way more than that and hopefully in, in in India and in the UK where there is a huge diaspora uh, as well. You know, I've done shows in Toronto and, and I think it's always like, um, it feels like you're among friends and family when when you do a show that's like, uh, that's like, for me anyways, uh, the, the people that follow my work, I, I relate to every single one of them as if they were part of my family. So it's a very comfortable environment. It's a very familiar environment. And that definitely deserves to be and live in a physical space as well. Do you find it weird then at your shows when it's people not from uh, from a certain Asian background that kind of don't really get the references or get what the text is, but are standing there kind of going like, I, I still take something away from this anyway. I can kind of, I feel I understand it, but this isn't terminology or phrasing or language that I would use. Is that weird? No, I mean, it's there's a there's a lot of folks that aren't from a South Asian background um, that relate to the work just because it is kind of like a lot of the themes are about feminism. A lot of the themes are about social change and everybody can relate to that. I use English for the for the captions and everything like that, um, which is good because I find that it it allows people to just google what it means instead of you know people kind of find it intriguing enough to look it up look up the meaning learn a little bit more about uh, our culture beyond butter chicken and yoga like you kind of understand how we live this dual sort of uh, environment of like uh, western society and, and kind of dealing with with that and, and and our own traditional culture that we hold on to uh, in every aspect of our of our lives so it's good i mean it, it teaches it teaches a lot about our culture to to those that are outside of it and it makes people feel included that that are that are a part of it i do have a lot of um fans and people that support the work that are into that that have married into uh they see families and they want to like impress their girlfriend with like a <laughs> poster or something or you know they're dating somebody and they really want to impress them with like something that I've made so that like it shows that they understand where where it's coming from and I think that's like a very cool niche market that I didn't expect like I wasn't thinking of that going into this but it's really cool but you're taking it and running with it I was going to say to to think that you had like the uh you, you could have been like the really good bridge for a good date night is really I mean that's, that's I mean I I might have I might have helped somebody help some of your <laughs> points for sure there's a lot of also uh young parents they have younger kids that are growing up that were born and raised in north america or, or in in western society and they, they want them to kind of learn 
more about the culture, but in like a quirky little uh, way uh, by using both English and Hindi. It's a good way to teach the language, although a lot of my work is just swear words, but there are some that, that are PG. So you you were not born in Canada. What you, I forgot what year you you your family moved to Canada. We moved here in two thousand. What was the what was young Maria like in the formative years growing up in was it was it near Toronto? It was in a suburb. Uh, right, called, right, right. Yeah. It was in a city called Scarborough. Hey. Okay. It was yeah Scarborough. There's a Scarborough, Scarborough and then here. We moved to, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Moved to Mississauga afterwards, <laughs> but yeah, very interesting childhood. Uh, I had never seen snow before. That was very, very cool to land into a country and there's snow falling from the sky. And we brought like a- literally a place that has like six months of winter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it uh, for the first few years, and then afterwards, every year after that, I was like, I, I do not wish to be here. <laughs> the for for the winter time but yeah i mean it was very confusing for me because i didn't understand like uh bullying that much i didn't like i knew english but i didn't know like uh for example i I i'd be called like 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 packy right that was that was a term i'd be called a lot and I'd be like, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I guess I came from Pakistan. It's a, it's a short form. It's like, no, 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 that's a bad thing. Like you should be ashamed of that. And I was like, really? Like, it was just confusing to me as to like, why, why do you hate me for, for what reason? And it, it really didn't click. And then of course, you know, uh, 9-11 and the, the whole terrorist thing and, and that whole thing started. And then, so all throughout elementary school, middle school, high school, like all the entire thing was just it's kind of like uh, this feeling of like, did I do something wrong by existing? You get really, you know, your everything you speak about becomes political really fast. Um, and so while I would have loved to uh, make artwork that was quirky and fun and like pretty or whatever, the themes that ended up becoming a part of my work ended up being very, very political and very, you know, feminist because I was, this was the only lens that I knew how to look through. This was like, this was kind of what shaped the way I looked at, uh, the world, um, and at, uh, at our own, at at our own people and how we were treated and how something that you're shamed for 10 years ago is now trending. Um, Mm -hmm. and so you kind of grow up feeling like you did something wrong and then realize that it wasn't your, it wasn't your fault at all and that you were right all along. Uh, it's a very confusing time. I mean, I'm still kind of figuring out how to, how to create work and, and, and focus it on my community, but also have it like. Yeah, it's it's a really when I think back to that time when I first moved here and what I learned from it, it's it's such a it's so complicated. Did you feel nervous about bringing your culture into your practice as opposed to just having this thing that's sort of telling you to let that go and to assimilate into what would be, you know, Western identity? Um, Did you feel nervous about you know, really celebrating and bringing your heritage into the forefront of the conversation. No, I wasn't nervous at all. That's the confusing part. I wanted to make this for for me, for my friends and family, because we found it hilarious and cool. And I wanted to make, I wanted this to exist, so I made it. The nervousness came when other people were kind of like, <clears throat> well, you know, do you want to make it more diverse? And I said, what do you mean? They're like, well, you know, like, uh, don't add bindis to it. Or like, you know, make it more diverse. I'm like, no, this is diverse. <laughs> This is like the definition right. of diverse. You need this. Like this right. needs to exist. I've had folks that, that ask me to make murals and, and go, well, can you add like uh, non-South Asians to this thing? And I was like, well, why are you asking me to make it then? Because this is all I do. This is what I do. Yeah. Right. I, I think the confusion comes from when when society that has been so conditioned to um, check boxes or like, uh, look at races as just something that they need to like include once and not actually engage and, and that kind of stuff. It gets really confusing for 
for them, it's never been confusing for me. It's always been like, this is who I am. This is what I want to make. It's cool. You know, my friends like it. My family likes it. My cousins like it. I think that's all. That's good enough for me, you know? Was this why was this why you didn't like working in the advertising world? Well, <laughs> the advertising world was very uh, male dominated. It was very white male dominated, and um, it got a little bit exhausting trying to constantly prove myself and then be called just you know it's like oh you're talking about race again oh you're like so oh my God, this, this doesn't matter. Like, let's just, you know, and a lot of the brands I worked for at the time too, like they would, we would be doing something simple, like sourcing stock images. And I'd be like, well, how about we insert like a few Brown people, like, you know, any other race in there. And, and it would be like, no, this is not the demographic we're trying to sell to. And it would be as transparent as that. It's like, no, we're not, we're not selling to that demographic. And I was like, it's not a demographic. It's like, it's candid. Like, I don't know. It's, it's such right. a weird, you know, you, you sit there and you kind of go, am I crazy? Or like, am I the one with like a crazy radical idea that you could just right. have diversity? There was like a new thing. I remember when I was working, like, I think this was like right before I got let go too. There was like a website that boasted about um, having diverse stock images. And it was like the newest thing. And like all the agencies were like, oh my God, this is revolutionary. I'm sitting there like, come on now. Come on. <laughs> and so when they let me go, I was kind of, I was relieved. It was on like a nice Wednesday afternoon, I think. And I was like, I'm going to go and I'm going to get some brunch. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to breathe. And I'm like, great. Now it's time to start something new. Had you already been making your own illustration work or, you know, or oil paintings before? What was what was your sort of artistic experience up until that point? Very secret. <laughs> Everything was made <laughs> in secrecy because it wasn't, I wasn't uh, allowed to be an artist. Oh, wait, so secret, secret to your family, like secret to everybody. Yes. Okay. Like if, okay. if my, right. like it was, it, I wasn't allowed to be an artist because I have, you know, my family works in, in medicine and, and it was kind of seen as like a, like arts and crafts. Like you, you don't, you don't show this off. This is like something you do maybe like once as when you're a child and then you stop, uh, which I found that concept to be really weird because every child learns how to paint and draw. But as soon as you do it as an adult, it's like, no way. This is like not a good career path. You're going to be a starving artist and, and all that stuff. And there's this weird stigma around it. So I'd never really, um, I made a lot of stuff, but I never really posted any of it. Um, the most I would post, I guess, if you go far back enough on my Instagram, you'll see my agency life. Um, and I used to post like meeting doodles or like uh, things that I would just draw when I'm really bored and try to find like a uh, a thing that I could uh, stick to. But it was really when I got laid off that I stopped really giving uh, a crap about what anyone thought of me because nobody could fire me. I already got let go. <laughs> so I was like, I'm just going to draw things that I like and um, hopefully my future employer doesn't find it and, um, and I get in trouble for it. Did that work have a similar kind of thread of you wanting to put your culture at the forefront or was it something? Yeah. Different? Yeah. It was always the case. I always wanted to make artwork that, that spoke to my culture because I missed it. You know, I, I, I was tired of not seeing anything at all represented anywhere, you know, uh, magazines, entertainment, like, TV shows, anything, music, you know, um, there was really nothing. So I just had what I had and I was like, I want this to be normalized. I don't want uh, anyone else to be shamed for for being proud of their culture, you know. It was honestly as simple as that. And were you into were you into comic book culture in a way? Because like the, the work has like, you know, you've obviously the Lichtenstein kind of riffs but also the comic book and just the idea of like kind of cell based storytelling. Like, were you into that stuff as a kid? Yeah. So I, I couldn't read like novels, like walls of text just made my brain really jumbled. So, um, graphic I thought you, you were going to say, gonna say you can't, you can't read. read. I was going to be like, that's a whole new podcast. podcast. <laughs> 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 just I can't digest long, 
uh, you know, paragraphs and things like that. Um, you know, like Watchmen, Spider-Man, things like that. That was just something that I, I really liked to read. And even now, I mean, I would, I would 100% pick up a picture book before I pick up a novel, which is, which is funny because I wrote a book. So right, I was that's, that's where we're going with this. Like, it took me way. Long. I had to push that deadline three times because I was like, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't turn out this many words. I, I don't even think I've ever spoken this many words. I don't know what else to write about. And they're like, just write about yourself. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know how. What was the driver behind that then, the book? The driver behind that was uh, just a collection of like the work that I had done so far, um, quirky little anecdotes and and things about my life. And the concept of uh, aunties and, and how there can be good and evil and, and a lot of the patriarchy is, is rooted, you know, women policing each other. And uh, at the end of it, obviously, we also talk about the uncles, but the book is really about self-policing and how much uh, of our culture is tradition and how much of it is patriarchy and what can we kind of get rid of um, like body shaming, colorism, uh, things like that, that are kind of just designed for, to keep women down. There's really no reason for it to exist. So that's what the book is about. And it's just a conversation really with my younger self, like uh, advice that I would have given to 12 year old me, uh, on how to like kind of navigate and get into the art world, uh, without pissing your parents off. Wait, so what did your parents and your family's response to, so you were saying how being an artist was not an option, but now you've got a book out, you've got shows, like things were happening, like did, was your family like, okay, like she's got a book now. Like, I mean, there's, there becomes a, something really real about it when it becomes like this historical document. Like was your parents like and your family kind of like, okay, we, we get it. I mean, it, it definitely took a while to warm up to because it is, I mean, when you really think about it, the art, like the life of an artist is not what it used to be five years ago or six years ago. You know, like artists weren't really required to be on Instagram or social media like that. And they weren't typically put up to this like um, influencer celebrity like sphere where like now you have uh, cross promotion with this big brand or like now you're selling this beer or whatever, you know, you're designing cans or this and that, like this wasn't really like a trend. Um, artists an artist was an artist. If you were a street artist, you're a street artist. If you're a fine artist, you know, you do abstract, you do, you, everyone had their own little bubble. Mm-hmm. Um, when I started this, um, obviously coming from an advertising background, I was like, well, okay, we got to do some merch and we got to do like this partnership and this, that, like, I just kind of treated it like I would treat any, brand that I worked for and said, why can't I be that? So I I kind of did this to myself where (laughs) I confused everybody around me and go, well, are you painting? Are you doing digital work? Are you doing like, um, merchandising or what are you doing? I'm like, I guess, I guess all of it. And I don't know how to explain, uh, to even like my family, what, what I'm doing, but it had, I started out in like the gallery space it would have maybe been easier to explain, okay, well, like I paint and then it goes into a gallery and then it gets sold and I paint again. And, but that's not the case anymore. It's like, uh, every new day, every day is like a completely different than the last. Do you think that if you had gone the other way, if you didn't have this background in advertising, it would have been harder to convince your parents though, about like the kind of the, you know, you're on Instagram, there's something tangible there. You've got branding, you've got merch. There's like these kind of, you know, there's a a, a visual presentation of exactly what you do. Whereas, you know, there's this notion of kind of like the years of struggling and starving artists. Would that have been a little bit trickier for them to come around to, do you think? There was definitely a year where I I was eating only ramen. Um, That was partially because I do like ramen, but also because (laughs) I had to really figure out, do I leave the agency world for good or do I continue taking contract gigs on the side and, uh, you know, paint uh, like when when I come home. And it became increasingly difficult to maintain both because there's this like, also this like moral standpoint that you have to take where it's like, okay, now you're perpetuating this like crazy capitalist, like you're selling this um, brand 
like you're going into an office and you're selling this brand that's like completely unethical and you know they're just paying your agency like two million dollars to like do something and you're coming home and you're making work about going against the grain and fighting the system and it's like okay well what I can't can't like you know morally I can't I can't go back to that so I had to make that decision and, and I didn't tell my parents no I just could you know kind of said oh yeah I'm working on this contract and that contract and it's kind of like just I lied <laughs> I just basically I just said uh, there like, we go that's you know, there we like, go oh, are you working like how's work going I'm like work is great I wouldn't specify what work but it was great um but thankfully, you know, uh, I had enough people that supported me and, and, you know, were kind enough to buy a T-shirt or buy a poster and, and kind of give me the opportunities to, like, uh, work on a book and work on um, different projects at the same time so I could continue doing what I, what I love doing. And I never really um, looked back. It was a very gradual um, build to what it is now. But when you look at when you look at the page now, you'd be like, Oh, my God, like you, you've done so much, so much stuff, but it really took a lot. It took half a decade to to get to where it is. It wasn't like an overnight thing. It was definitely a struggle at first, but not too much of it. It's such a good thing that you just said that I've never heard before. Like, it's it's almost harder to explain your life as an artist to people like now in the digital world than it would have been like, 15 years ago when you were just a painter like I haven't heard it articulated that way now I'm like wow that's actually really that's true like it's there's so many opportunities for artists now or like there's just you could do so much that it almost feels like yeah what how do I explain what I do to people and it, I, I've never thought of it that way but it's true I never studied e-commerce and now I'm a pro <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not I'm still learning like I, I don't know I honestly I have no idea like looking for vendors and like doing you know like sourcing like ceramics and like all this stuff like I had no idea and you know producing and most of the time like when you order something from my website I'm the one that's a answering the customer co complaints it's like hi Maria here I'm so sorry your t-shirt was not delivered you know how can I help? <laughs> not that that happens very often I was just trying not to put any customers off that would be listening. Trying to make sure that they know <laughs> that you are running a tight ship and that if they head onto your website now, they'll receive excellent service and a great quality product. Very it's me strictly. personally handling all of, their, uh, all of their concerns. So if you have bought something, you can definitely reach out to me one-on-one -on -one and have a conversation about whatever you want. Wait a minute, get a pen name. What are you, like, like just be like... Be like Martha. I don't know. Just do some some other name. I think people understand. Uh, no. I, I think everyone's pretty understanding, especially during this time. The best thing that you can do in the online space as uh, as what you're doing, like as an artist, is to be honest about life, which I found out very recently is the thing that I should do more. I should be more open about my personal life as well, because this year has kicked everybody's ass. Like it's kicked my ass multiple times you know um yeah. going through you know obviously not being able to see your family and your friends for a long period of time going through like a breakup or going through um you know therapy and stuff like that this is kind of it makes it, it reminds people that okay you're looking at this person online but this is a real person behind the screen this is not like a brand or like a cool like obviously it is but there's a person making this and that person has their own lives and you're kind of along on this journey together. And it makes everyone a little bit more empathetic and understanding, which I really appreciate. So is that what then becomes the source material? Let's use your new show as an example. Like, is that how you source the material for the paintings? Is it is it that personal? Or do you have like generalized ideas of things that you wanna get across? Everything I make has either had happened to me or that I've like witnessed or I've been a part of like every single thing. Uh, and there's no like a process of like I send it to like a bunch of people and they go, yeah, this is <laughs> it. like there's a focus group. It's just me. Um, yeah. So anytime somebody likes a thing or anytime somebody shows up to an exhibit, I'm genuinely very surprised because I have no idea who 
would relate to it or who would um, go, oh, well, that's like I went through the exact same thing. And recently, you know, I posted a bunch of stuff from the new show and I had tons and tons of women and men that were really like sharing their life stories. And they were, they were like, you know, uh, I went through a very similar thing and, you know, I have, uh, you know, went through a, a divorce and I went through like this and that and this kind of, uh, uh, you know, I also have PTSD and, you know, sharing their very personal life stories um, with me and going, this is a very human experience. Like it is, you know, it's on Instagram. Yes. It's on a virtual gallery. Yes. But everyone it's a, it comes from a very real place. So that was something I really appreciated. And it was the exact same vibe that I got when it was a show in real life where I did, you know, talk to a lot of people that, that told me their, their life stories, which is the best part about all of this. That sounds like the most terrifying thing in the world. Not the hearing life stories, but the kind of like putting <laughs> yourself and your experiences out into the ether and then just letting that sit. Yeah. Is that not the most terrifying thing in the world? That's like, I could, I could stand on a stage and talk in front of, you know, 10,000 people and I would feel more comfortable doing that than I would be like just, just doing half of a real experience online. I can't speak I'm in with, front of I'm like with a you on that. 100%, 100% Doug, I'm with you. Wait you, wait, you can't do the 10,000 people or you can? I can't, I can't, I can't do public speaking okay. at all. If somebody asked me to make a speech, I'd be like, I'd rather, I'd rather be dead. I would rather hide. Or you'd rather go online and tell them about this mad experience you had about <laughs> exactly. this really would, personal thing that happened that. to you. Cause yeah. then it's like, you know, you, you, I don't know. There's a level of uh, comfort and honesty that I feel when, when doing that. Not comfort. I wouldn't say comfort, actually. That's a lie. It's just like, I just, I felt like in that moment, I had to be honest. I was like, I, I guys, I'm not like a girl boss, boss bitch that's like taking over. Like, yeah, nothing can hurt me. No, like a lot can hurt me. A lot has hurt me. And I need for you all to know so that, you know, I'm not like this rallying, like, Yes, like I'm fighting for, no, like I am very much capable of being hurt and being in a vulnerable place. And this year has been one of the most challenging for mental health purposes for me. And while putting on a show where you have like 20 new pieces and you have to do uh, interviews and, and X, Y, Z, and then men like, you know, kind of navigating that kind of space where you are put on this pedestal is this like cool like artist that's like saying all this like um edgy stuff meanwhile you're kind of like you're in this blanket burrito just like wondering if you should like leave the house today to you know do groceries or like whatever you kind of just like scared of everything um it's a it, it was a very challenging thing but i'm i'm glad that i shared it with everyone so that how does your online persona differ from your real world persona i type in all caps i'm not usually that loud <laughs> you, the first thing you said to us shall i you said shall i just shout into the mic <laughs> <laughs> i guess i'm just now morphing into that but yeah i mean i'm, I'm very uh again as i said i, I work alone I'm, I'm not very i'm not super social i don't have like uh, tons of like parties and friends and like that kind of stuff i just kind of stay within my own little world and and go out to see people that i love and stay close to them it's good because then i kind of like i get to continue making what i make without it having um like without it getting to like uh thinking too much about it, uh, like getting it to my head or like, oh, is this person going to feel this way? Or like, is that person going to say this or whatever? So it's good to have like a small circle, whereas online, of course, there's like um, hundreds of thousands of people that are that are watching it. But yeah, I, I guess I would say it's the same because the work comes out of me and it comes from me. Um, it differs probably because it's a lot of colors. I wear mostly black. <laughs> Maybe that's that's the only difference I could say. It's funny because I, I tried to post a lot of like uh, to in an effort to be more like people facing. I try to post like selfies and like photos and stuff like that. And every time I do that, I, I lose a whole bunch of followers because 
uh, one time I posted a selfie and, and someone was like, oh, you're posting selfies now? You're not doing art anymore? And I was like, come on, wow. <laughs> give me this wow. one thing. Wow, it's a critical world out there, isn't it? I hate, I I gotta be honest, I, I, I have, Doug has heard this speech many times, but I'm so close to just getting the fuck off Instagram and never never looking back. But then I have to do the He's juxtapose all one. So then I'm like, well, f- I know I am all talk. He's all talk. I'm He's just been saying so- this for years. I don't like mean comments. I don't like mean comments. I hate it. I'll leave nice comments on your page. Don't worry. You can post Thank selfies so and, I'll, and I'll say nice comments. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to see a whole rebranding of Jux now. Jux is just going to be Evan selfieing. Just no, like, just, my, just, pers- just my personal account. Does it, does it feel weird for you to have professional success in a year that's like pretty much... For so many people, a year of non-professional or personal success. It 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 is, it is honestly because to me, like I feel like a responsibility to give back now more than ever. I have always allocated a part of my business to charity, basically every year since like I launched the shop, like the online shop. Now it's kind of like okay, there has to be. I think the gallery has to now be involved in the charity aspect as well. You know, my commercial work has to be involved in the charity aspect as well. I can't just go off and do a collaboration with a brand and then go, well, I'm going to keep every, like, we're just going to get the, the, the revenue from this. It, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I actually had to cancel almost all of my brand partnerships this year because of how you know, because of how tone deaf companies have been during this entire time, you know, it's just kind of like, how can you ask me to be a part of this like diversity campaign where you have allocated nothing to, to help any sort of movement or any sort of, uh, anyone struggling, uh, because of COVID because of like police brutality, because of whatever that's going on, your brand has done absolutely nothing and you think hiring me to be the face of some diversity thing is going to solve your problems. It's not. And so I had to let go of a lot of business. So yes, the gallery, the the show did really well um, because I made that post about like guys, like the world is on fire, but really (laughs) that's, that's what I had to like, that's what I had to do in order for it to be success. I had to be honest about it because sugarcoating it with just business as usual is not going to work anymore. And I think that's what artists of color have been trying to communicate their entire careers and what the art world is now just catching on to because they don't want to get canceled or they don't want to get like exposed for like not paying people of color for running their galleries or like not paying artists of color on time and this and that. There's tons of stories about that. So this is really a challenging time for art institutions. It is a very interesting time for, I mean, I would say personally, from my personal experience as an artist of color, it's a very interesting time for me because now it's more like, are you using me for like to cover your ass? Like, do I have to do research on you and like figure out what you've done and make sure that you're good to go before I can participate in your thing? Yeah, so I think moving moving forward, everyone's a lot more conscious do you see this having a this moment which feels like one of the biggest in my certain memory from all the all the previous incarnations of what this is do you in from your experience feel that this is something different or do you feel that it potentially could just be a, a moment that will result back in to the normality of whatever it was that we had before I mean I I personally will do everything that I possibly can to remind whoever I'm working with if they are not, you know, if, if they are, you know, like a, like a white male institution or they have a history of like only employing, a, you know, people, you know, non POCs and then, you know, I have to, I have to correct them and I have to be vocal about it to ensure that we can, we can at least make like some change from my, from where I am. But it is really, it shouldn't be the job of, of, of POC to, to educate uh, right. the institutions. It should really just be more research and work on, on their end to make sure that they're, they're doing what they can to, to include everyone or to make space for everyone and not, or I guess not take up space where they don't need to. How about that? 
making space is like, okay, but I think it's more like stop doing things that are actively putting people of color down. Well, you, you said it earlier too, when you were working at the, um, the advertising company, um, in, in Toronto, which is such a diverse city, I believe it was Toronto. Um, and they, and them not paying attention to what was like the city that they were based in, like the diversity of the, of their own city they lived in wasn't registering, which to me is like, that's sign number one. Like, just look at the place where you live. If you happen to live in Toronto, like look around, like it's, this is what it, it seems it's baffling at times. Right. I think Mad Men was also like trending at the time. So everybody just wanted like that weird, <laughs> like white male culture to thrive, like cigars and like hiding whiskey bottles on their bottom drawer and like a change of clothes and cheating on their wives or whatever they wanted to do. But that was like, it was so glamorized and glorified that it kind of became like hip yeah. to, to be uh, completely ignorant. But they misunderstood, they misunderstood the show. Because <laughs> the show was about how the world was changing and how stuck in the mud that those guys really like. They didn't fucking think a little deeper about. I I just watched the show for the first time, like all the way through during the beginning of the pandemic. So I just wanted a project, and like that was part of the show's appeal was that it was talking about how these old white men needed to evolve with the times. Like I don't understand. Okay, anyway. Diatribe. Yeah. Diatribe over. I, I, I mean, there were agencies where, like, where groups of women just quit, like, all together. Like, they would they would just quit uh, because of how toxic the culture was, um, and that they would, you know, I went for an interview at one of one of the agencies, and and I was like, well, so so why are you specifically hiring more women? And the guy was laughing. He's like, yeah, like, uh, twelve women quit like last week, and I was like, what? 12 women just quit like that? What was the reason? They're like, oh, you know, it's just, it's just happened. I'm like, okay, that's a huge red flag. It's a perfectly normal thing to happen. I just want to say real quick, I had written down in my notes before we started this, that I bet <laughs> within the first 30 minutes of this conversation, Evan drops a Mad Men reference. And I was- Fuck off. I was Seriously, off. fuck I, yeah, off seriously, because, I, because I did it, not so. bring it up this time. I know Shh, Maria I know brought it up, didn't bring fuck it up. off. <laughs> but it was in there. Uh, it was so funny. I knew it had to come up. Have I brought it up, have I brought it up every podcast? You brought it up in uh, in the last two or three. And because I knew of your advertising background, and I was like, oh, there's no way that this isn't coming because up. Because there's it's, no <laughs> way. Because everybody, everybody can relate to that show because they've seen that show. It's like it's a glorification of a past era that we can critique. Fuck off. You're one of my best friends, but fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing he's, he's sorry about that he's, he's gone i apologize for <laughs> what are like you've now been doing this for a little bit of time and experiencing you know more and more artists from around the world that might be getting you know into your work but ha are there some like south asian artists that like perhaps that doug and i don't know about or that th the audience in general doesn't know about that you've learned about that you want to like give a shout out to? yeah i mean i i wonder I wonder if Juxtapose has covered covered them, but you did cover Hiba Shabazz, who I think is really, of course. really yeah, cool. Yeah. She's uh, awesome. Just Chote Singh is also one of these uh, uh, one of the artists that I really love, um, and the themes uh, that they speak about is is amazing. Salman Tour obviously um, is yeah. amazing. Um, there's tons. I mean, if you guys want a list, I can compile it and, and send you an email, but it's good to reach out and, and explore new diverse artists because a lot of them are on Instagram first now. Um, sure. and that's how they're getting discovered. Um, that's how I'm discovering them anyways, because of, you know, now I, I guess you can't really, I can't remember the last time I walked into an art gallery. <laughs> it's like very sad. Okay. Um, pre COVID. I know. It's, I was just thinking about today, I'm like, I miss looking at things like in, in real life, like tangible. So I guess the Instagram will do, but yeah. Do you think um, that your experience of coming, uh, of coming up at a certain age when your parents were pressuring you to follow any path that wasn't art, do you see the next gen coming up do you think they'll still have that same pressure no matter what it's just part of it's part of the experience that you're going to have when you come from a south asian background or do you think it's going to become increasingly diluted after people like yourself show 
that it there is a, there is a there, you can have a successful job and be respected doing something creative mm -hmm. um i think even if the younger generation was pressured to become something else i don't think they would give a shit because the the I think they just generally have more fire and drive um, than we did uh, when when we were growing up. Like I'm 29, and when I was a teen, obviously I fought everybody to do what I wanted. Uh, and even if I didn't have the the strength to fight anymore, I would just go and do the thing that I wanted to do anyways. This generation, I mean, the I have so many high school students, university students coming to the gallery and you know, message me and, and actively wanting to talk about social change. Um, whereas when we were growing up, I mean, we did to, if, so if you talked about things like that, if you talked about social justice back in that day, you would be considered like, what is, why are you so obsessed with politics? What is wrong with you? You would be considered an outcast, but now it's like so normalized, which is amazing. And it's something that definitely is just a very, very positive thing. And so I'm really excited for this younger generation and for the art that they're going to make because it's really coming from a place of like, we don't give a shit about your old traditional ideals that are really just, um, you know, it, they're just designed to hold people back for no reason, um, especially women and especially young women. And so I'm, I'm super, super excited to see what, what that's going to be and definitely i don't think any any sort of i don't know i i really do believe in 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 the younger generation because i i just see that they're angry about the right things you know they're they're upset and they're and they're willing to take action and change it and that motivates me a lot when i hear somebody that's like 15 or 16 like come and talk to me about you know dismantling uh like colonialist you know ideals in, in the art world and things like that i'm like this is fucking awesome like you're yeah. you're sitting there you're not like wasting your time with like i mean you could be whatever but like <laughs> you're 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 reading up on on things that are just like i mean it's just generally just awesome social awareness getting younger is is a good uh is a one of the benefits of social media which i think is good yeah and they can all dance which is really cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they can all, all of them can dance. I like that sweeping general, generalization of the youth. <laughs> <laughs> they can all dance. I'm pretty sure every 15 year old now is just a wonderful dancer, just ready for the, a, a career in choreography <laughs> for sure. I tried and I failed and I'm just going to stick to what I know. By the way, I, I, I think I asked this every single uh, podcast too. Um, are you on TikTok? I am, but I'm just. Oh, you are. Okay. I okay. just lurk. I just lurk. I use it for lurking. I don't know yeah. if I have uh, enough. Like uh, maybe when I have more, I guess, time to explore like animation or things like that, I would probably put myself on TikTok. But you won't. You won't find me dancing on it now, unfortunately. Yeah. It was. That was more. It was more so a question if I was wondering if artists know how to use it yet, because I'm curious. Oh yeah, I mean, my favorite thing to watch is like the oddly satisfying TikToks where like you're smearing the paint and like, oh know, okay, yeah, places or like. Uh, I also love the animators on there, the the 3D animators yeah. or like the just like the 2D and they make little like cartoons that are dancing to the TikTok dances. I think that's really cool. Just generally, just that kind of stuff. I mean, I think the way artists, it's very easy for an artist to use TikTok. It could be tutorials, the DIY hacks, um, you know, a lot of uh, like how to um, make your own clothing or like uh, it yeah. branches off into fashion and things like that. The DIY side of that app is is really, really uh, helpful. I mean, I have like a ton saved. I don't know if I'm going to ever do any of them because there's so right. many things. But uh, yeah, I've definitely learned some life hacks from there. I was like, okay. okay. Do you think it'll dismantle Instagram as the number one platform for artists? I think each platform has its own benefits and, and the way that people use them. I haven't really seen any real similarities between the two apps. I use TikTok as like just like a mindless scroll through like videos that are just like funny and like kind of like Vine. Um, but Instagram, I kind of go there. I have four accounts. <laughs> 
I have four Instagram accounts. Wait, what? Yeah, I have the main one, Hey Copy. I have right. one that's just my personal one where I post selfies because I can't post them on my main account. And then I have my fan account. Not not a hey, it's not a hey copy fan account. It's like a general, just like a a K pop fan account. And then I have a and then I have a food blog. Oh wow. I use the other ones to lurk mostly. Tell me tell I can't let this slide. Tell me about the K pop <laughs> one. Because yeah, I that? owe it to I can't I owe it that's to the, the secret listeners. of the K pop fan account. I actually can't tell you about it. It just it exists. There's a lot of management. That's so much <laughs> management. You know, every every page has its own purpose, and not not everybody knows about each of them. My family, my friends and family, don't even know about them. So, well, yeah. Radio Juxtapose listeners, you you got yourself a little exclusive. Not the exclusive you thought you were getting, but it's Epi- <laughs> episode fifty has been special for many reasons. Exactly. Uh, and I wonder if anyone now... can find my food blog. It's not that big. So wait, so what's uh what's next? What do you I mean you just opened a show, so you could just you could kick back for a while, but like what what do you got coming up? Anything you wanna give a shout out to or, or are you just gonna like spend the rest of your summer um managing Instagram accounts? I don't know. I well, I was actually playing around <laughs> with projection mapping uh recently. Oh, that's cool. So so that's something I wanna I wanna take a stab at it. Um it's just cool, you know. I think working with projections and working with the more digital sort of installation themes, um, kind of just taking this time to stay inside and grow my skills and yeah. see what else I can learn and put out there. And you know, so once we're a lot like allowed to go outside again, I can come up with something really cool and big, and, and, and maybe hopefully do like a festival or like a you know something cool and new. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not very exciting in my house right now. It's just, you know, building furniture and installing shelves and I've never been home this long, like in my life. So now I'm realizing like that I have not, like, I don't have anything together. Like I, I need a rug, you know, I needed a bed frame. Is your studio separate? It used to be separate, but, uh, because of COVID and whatever i couldn't really risk being around like other like uh, other people so i just uh started painting in my own apartment and that's okay it's going all right it's it's pretty small like toronto apartments are not becoming like new york style like very very tiny closets in the sky so it's really interesting dragging a seven foot painting up you know into a condo building and getting weird looks but it's all part of the job. It's a, it, like, like there's a lot of weird shit going on right now. If that weirds people out, fuck them, you know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Do you remember that bit when Evan called me one of his best friends? That was dead nice, that bit, wasn't it? Mind you, he did tell me to fuck off right after it, so, you know, mixed signals there. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this interview. At 29, Maria really does have her shit in check. So hopefully that's given some of you out there a little bit of motivation through what has quite honestly been a weird year. As always, if you enjoyed this, let us know. Hit the subscribe button, leave us a review. We'll be back real soon. Till then, look after yourselves, look after each other. Peace. Peace.